Good morning. We bring you greetings from the Harmony Pearl Baptist Church, Kilgore, Texas. We're grateful that you were able to join us this morning. May we bow in prayer. Eternal and ever blessed God, I give you thanks as the day comes to an end for those who mean so much to me and without whom life could never be the same. I thank you for those to whom I can go to at any time and never feel a nuisance. I thank you for those to whom I can go when I'm tired, knowing that they have for the weary feet the gift of rest. I thank you for those with whom I can talk and keep nothing back, knowing that they will not laugh at my dreams or mock my failures. I thank you for those in whose company joys are doubtfully dear, doubly dear, and sorrow's bitterness is soothed. I thank you for your nearness and protection this day. In the name of Jesus, we ask God for our prayer. Amen. We call your attention this morning to the book of Isaiah, the 54th chapter, the book of Isaiah, the 54th chapter, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. The 54th chapter, the book of Isaiah, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Sing, O barren, you have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. You have not labored with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and to the left and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inherited. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame, for you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. We're going to talk this morning from the subject, it doesn't make sense, but it works. It doesn't make sense, but it works. Samuel Johnston once wrote the great works, uh, said that great works are performed not by strength, but by struggle. Not just by talent, but also by perseverance. Another writes say that struggle exists in the tension created by the push of the new. Struggle and the tension against the new, the future against the substance of today. And today wrestles in the shadows of the setting sun against residue that yesterday's struggle provided. Struggle is born in the critical of change Remember, my brothers and sisters, that seeds struggle to break of its bud when it's planted to, uh, to the, in the, planted in the ground. Germination only takes place after the struggle and not before. Only then, the tender sprouts struggle against the soil to break free. A blossom struggles against the limitation of the bud before it blooms, a chick must struggle its way through the outer shells of the egg to be born, and the butterfly must struggle by beating its wings against the cocoons in order to develop the muscles necessary to fly. The night struggles with the day, and the pre-done smack down before it surrounds to the light. A baby must struggle its way through the birth canal. It takes its first before it takes its first breath. Much in the same way, 
an ideal struggles through what is or what used to be before unfolding what can be when its time has fully come. And sometimes, in spite of the struggle, we still wake up one day and find that we're not where we expect it to be. We have struggled, yet we have moved forward. We experience the pain, but we don't see any gain. And we find that we're not where we expect it to be 5, 10, 15, or 20 years ago. It just blows our mind that we're not living the life that we planned on living. Not living with whom we planned to live, to live with. We're not in the place we're told of all our friends about. And the truth is that after all of our stretching and our struggling, we are still not in the place that we expect it to be. We're still struggling to rise up off our valley floors after being knocked down again. We're struggling just to navigate the treacherous waters of the uncertain. We're struggling just to stand our ground and to raise our voice and still we're not where we expected to be. We didn't imagine life could be like this. We never dreamed in a million years we would be where we are today. It never crossed our mind that this is where we would be in 2021. In our text, we hear the prophetic voice of the Babylonian exile and what is called the fourth servant song in Isaiah. This is a call to praise and a proclamation of salvation uh, before the conclusion of the book in chapter 55. Here in this song, the prophet's basic lexicon includes words like faith, righteousness, the Holy One of Israel, and salvation in Zion. The text begins and ends with God speaking. And as God speaks, God is making good use of feminine language. God is making use of feminine metaphors, such as wife and barren women, and images alluding to widows. And so the focus of the song is evident that after a season of forced separation from their homes and families, loved ones and loved places, after a season of where they didn't expect to be, and doing what they didn't expect to be doing, and worshiping in a place where they, didn't where they didn't expect to worship, that after a season of forced separation, where they were struggling in a strange land, pain and no gain, where they hung their hearts on the willow trees because they couldn't sing the Lord's song in a strange land. After all of this, all of a sudden things are about to change. The song announces the restoration was on the way. And so to announce the restoration, to announce the change, the women were summoned to sing. Things are about to change in the kingdom. And the women were summoned to sing. Who was to announce what God's plans were all about? The women were summoned to sing. That's a praise moment right here. Now the women of Israel, uh, they were singers throughout the Hebrew Bible. We see that they sing at festivals. They sang when the fields were planted. Uh, they sing at harvest time. Uh, they sing uh, when babies were born. They sang when the wine was blessed. They sang joyous songs of celebration. They sang songs of victory. They sang during periods of mourning and grief. They sang laments expressing grief and sorrow and loss and despair. Miriam organized the women to sing after the crossing of the sea. 
Hannah sing after the birth of Samuel. Deborah sing after the enemies of God were vanquished, were vanquished and many sung after the visitation of the Holy Spirit. You will note that in Isaiah 32, the women sing to announce a shift as well. They were unaware that the people were failing to live a godly life for a holy God. And they were called to sing songs of lament and despair. For the future was going to be a struggle. But it is no longer chapter 32. But it's now chapter 54. And the women were summoned to sing. They were not summoned to sing the songs of chapter 32. But they were also summoned to sing a new song. They were summoned to sing a new song that was different, a song that did not reflect where they were, but they were summoned to sing a song that said where they were going. They were not summoned to sing a song about where they were, but where they were going. They were isolated, they were separated and barren, but this time they were summoned to sing songs of restoration. Songs that said the season of lack is over and the season of abundance had arrived. They were not summoned to sing a song about where they were, but they were going, but where they were going. They were isolated. They were separated and barren. But this time they were summoned to sing songs of restoration. Songs that said the season of lack is over and the season of abundance have arrived. They were not summoned to sing, sometimes I feel like a motherless child, our Lord hold back the night. They were not singing, Lord help me to hold out. They were summoned to sing songs like, I'm living in the overflow. Uh, and they were singing, uh, showers of blessings, or the storm is passing over. They were called to sing a song that God looked beyond my faults and saw my needs. They were summoned to sing songs, not of where they were, but of where they were going. And maybe we're getting where we're getting because we're singing the wrong songs. Look at somebody and say, it's time to change your tune. The women were summoned to announce a change, to sing a song different from their present situation. Just like a nightingale sings at the darkest hour before the dawn, they were not instructed to sing songs that ignore the present realities or to sing songs of make-believe. But they were summoned to sing songs of hope as if things were already better, as if victory was already won. In other words, don't wait until the bell is over. You need to shout now while you're going through the situation. The song they sing is addressed to barren women. It was a song to those unable to produce even though they had all of the necessary biological equipment. That was a metaphor, metaphor for Israel. The people of Israel had everything they needed to produce. The education, the training, the preparation, the degrees, the experience. They had everything they needed to produce, to plant churches, to grow churches, to start new ministries. They had everything they needed to produce. They had all the gifts to produce but they had a track record of none production. So the prophet used the image of a barren woman, someone who had not produced, to refer to Israel as a whole. In ancient time, a barren woman was symbolic of grief and mourning. A barren nation was equivalent to desolation and exile. But the text testified that 
God said to barren Israel, enlarge your house. That doesn't make sense. Let out your curtains. Has God lost his mind? Let out your boundaries. Move the stakes. Lift the cards and don't hold back. Are you serious? You will spread out to the right. Who are, who are you talking to? And to the left and your descendants will possess the nations and will sell the desolate towns. That doesn't make any kind of sense. I mean, here is the question of the hour. Why would God ask a barren woman to sing a pregnant song? That's the question of the hour. Here comes the answer. First, God did it because as the text announces, the place of the prophet's failure, of the people's failure, will become the place of their greatest victory. Did you hear that? In other words, the place that they thought they would never get back to will now become the place God will send them back to. Not as a defeated nation, but as a victor. Look at the promises in verses 14 and 15. There will be no more terror, no more strife. It will be a place of righteousness. Again, your faith has been tested. The struggle has now produced strength. The place where you thought you would never get in together, God is going to send you back in victory. You have been tested and you have been tried. Second, God did it because the mindset they had was not large enough for what they were getting. So they were told to plan for greater things. Look at the words that are used here. He uses expand, increase, let out, remove limitations, make room to grow. Well, you must be kidding. Go beyond your present boundaries. What was God saying? Well, God was saying to Israel then and to us now that the mindset you have is not large enough for what is coming. So God is trying to help you lift your eyes off of the small you have now, but Expand your vision and horizon for the Lord. God is sending you. We should be tired of our narrow uh, circles and narrow-minded folk with narrow expectations. I mean, they don't expect you to go anywhere or do anything. Nothing good anyway. They don't expect you to do a real ministry. But God says, Increase, expand, and grow. Get ready for what God is sending you because the mindset that you've got now is not large enough for what is coming. In other words, even though you are not pregnant yet, go pick out the baby furniture. You don't have the job yet, but go and pick out a wardrobe for success. You don't have that promotion yet, but go and pick out some new office furniture. You don't have the mortgage money yet, but go and look for a house and pick out the one you'd like to have. You don't have the money for a tuition, but yet go ahead and register online. He or she hasn't asked you to marry, but start making plans together. It's not here yet, but God says, Get ready anyhow. You don't have it yet, but get ready anyhow. God wants you to prepare for the largest blessing that he is sending you. Well, God has so. Well, God says increase, let out, expand, grow, remove the boundaries. God didn't tell you how far. This, uh, that is because the size of your blessing is determined by 
the room that you make for it. Remember the widow who was going to die and she only had a little oil. The prophet said to go and get pots. Go get pots because the oil God was going to send her was more than she had uh, containers for in her own house. And after she collected the pots, God filled them. Watch this. And the oil did not stop coming until the space she had provided was filled. My God, if you make room for it, God will fill it. Finding a promise in the women's woman's song was not just for them, but for those who were coming after them. Isn't that what the third verse says? It says, for you will spread out to the right and to the left, and that your children, your daughters in ministry, will possess the nation. Did you hear that? That uh, your daughters, uh, your children, will in ministry will possess the nation. There are generational benefits for what God is going to do. The blessings for one generation will be so large that they'll be passed down to the next generation. That means the present generation will be restored but their children will possess the nation. That's why we have to realize that God's work is so important that we have to make sure not only that we we're here, that, but that your next generation comes along. You see, the job of the next generation is greater than ours. The next generation will overcome the oppressors and conquer territory beyond our influence. They will be educated, many in numbers, obedient to God. And God promises protection from their enemies outside the city. This is a generational blessing. The exiles of Israel were going to be blessed in order to be a blessing. In other words, the blessing was not just for them, but so they could share it with the next generation. Your being blessed is not just for you, but so you can pass it down. Now, in order to get what God has for you, you must let go your expectations of how the process works. You see, we expect things to come in an orderly, natural process. Process. A to Z. The letter know their places. And no matter what, Z always know it comes last. So if Z has always been last, Z has no expectation of being first. But God will jump over preconceived notions and God will jump over birth orders. God will jump over all of the expectations and traditions of humankind. And if God wants Z first, that's exactly where Z will be and nobody can do anything about it. Because God determines where Z ought to be. So, what do you want to put your life uh, in the hands, uh, in the hands of God, or in the hands of humankind? I put myself in the hands of God. I know it doesn't make sense, but it works. It works. Quit trying, my brothers and sisters, trying to figure out how God is going to do it. Just let God do it. It didn't make sense for Gideon to narrow down his army to 300 men, but it worked. It didn't make sense for a shepherd boy to go against a nine foot giant, but it worked. It didn't make sense for Nehemiah to leave a good government job 
and go back to rebuild Jerusalem, but it worked. It didn't make sense to turn the Pharisee of Pharisees into an apostle of Jesus Christ, but it worked. Love your enemies and bless them that curse you. It doesn't make sense, but it worked. Do good for them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you. It doesn't make sense, but it works. If someone sins against you, forgive them 70 times seven. It doesn't make sense, but it works. All things, did you hear what I said? All things, not just some, but all things, including setbacks and heartaches, work together for good to them who love the Lord. And we are called according to his purpose. It doesn't make sense to us, but it works. It doesn't make sense for Jesus who worked, walked among his enemies and wasn't touched to stand before his accusers in silence. He was beaten. He was nailed. He was ridiculed. He was hung out on an old rugged cross. It didn't make sense, but it worked. It did work. It does work. And it will work again and again. It worked for them. It'll work for you. Some of you are in situations. You don't know what to do. And you're wondering how God is going to work it out. But God has already worked it out while you're trying to figure it out. Some of you are in situations. But God has already handled the situation. It doesn't make any sense seemingly to you. How things are going. You're at a dead end street. You don't know what to do. But I want to tell you. God has it in control. It does not make any sense to us, but God has it worked out. It doesn't make any sense to you, but it worked. May God bless you and mighty keep you as our prayer. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.